to his mum, but he's uh, been producing many bits over the years. You might know him as Domu, you might know him as Rima with uh, Enrique, who you saw earlier, uh, as a DJ, as Sonar Circle, drum and bass producer, and I'm not even going to try and list the other ones because there's millions and I'll get lost and confused. Yeah. You well? I'm okay. I think uh, a, a good idea is, is to, to What's a Domu track you've got for us, or a track that you've done that's just a good way to kind of show people what you're about? Well, I'll play the vocal of this. It's, um, I do a lot of remixes, um, and I do really enjoy... As you, as you said before, you're a, you're, you're a breakdown man, and you said you're a, you know, you're a bit of a rave kid. Going right back for you, I mean, it all came from the DJing side of things, and you, were a D you started DJing very young, 14 years old. Yeah. Tell us about these times, man. Well, I wasn't really into anything as a teenager. I'm really rubbish at sport and, you know, generally quite quiet at school. So DJing is a great thing you can learn on your own and not have to show anyone until you're kind of good and you're kind of happy with it. So when I was 14, I, you know, I had nothing else really going on. I just pushed myself into music. And really before that, I had no interest in music at all. Um, I just, you know, I, I played with toys until the age of about 12 and just that, you know, and I was just in fantasy world and then DJing, you know, music came along and it was jungle and it was hardcore and it was rave and it was a really exciting time in British music. And I was just at the age where I understood it completely, it meant something to me, it was, it had elements of teen angst, it had, you know, kind of this drug culture thing with it as well and it was all quite rebellious because in the late 80s, there was the acid thing that happened. And I saw and I read in the newspapers these acid house parties and the middle classes were up in arms about it. And it had a kind of teenage rebellion appeal to it. I mean, 92, 93, uh, you know, musically, within that whole spectrum, what, what were the labels, the DJs, the parties that stood out for you? Uh, it, it started as illegals, you know, from the late 80s, but into the 90s, early 90s, there was, a, around the kind of in England, you know, the M25 circular, uh, outside of London, there was a big kind of, kind of Middle England uh, commuter belt that, of, of young people that started doing illegal raves in warehouses. And there was raves like Exodus and Rain Dance and things like this. <clears throat> and they're all free parties. And I'm from Bedfordshire, which is around London. Yeah, it's, a, it's a shire around London. And this scene was really created out of lots of young people that didn't have any clubs or anything relevant to themselves. Um, and then the DJs that were playing at these illegal scenes just became household names for, for the kids through tapes, swapping tapes at school. So the first tape I had was like a Groove Rider tape from, um, what was that club he used to do with, that Goldie Rage. used to Yeah, Rage. Yeah. A Groove Rider Rage tape. Um, and then it went on from there because 92 was the summer of the big raves, you know, uh, Dreamscape and... Um, and yeah, all the, all, the, all the big things like that. And then also you had the rave stuff in the charts like Prodigy and Alternate. So it was all there and to piece together to become part of it. Was this sort of very much the stage where you had, you know, your, your people like Carl Cox and Evil Weedy Carl Cox was... And Carl Cox was... And, and then there was no boundary, you know, but now we have Jungle, Drum and Bass, Texter, Happy Hardcore, whatever, everything is genre-fied and, and sub put into a little box but back then you know back then um these golden days it was it wasn't as segregated uh, carl cox used to play a rough kind of amen bleepy rave track and then play a really stupid chipmunk record <laughs> with fast pianos and it was all it was all the same thing because it was a primitive music and it hadn't been established and although there is some rubbish in that, it does make for um, a quite honest scene. I mean, for you, obviously, you know, as a producer now, your, <clears throat> your palette is wide and varied. I mean, was this kind of born out of this whole early rave ethos of, you know, you, if it was four to the floor, if it was like a dirty Belgium kind of army <laughs> style thing, it was, you are all into it. Yeah, but the thing is, I've never really done drugs. I've never been, and I was 14 and 15 at this time, so I wasn't doing acid and doing ease and going off my head and raving because I was too young. Um, I, I was just interested in the fusion element of it because I grew up listening to my mum listening to soul, Tamla Motown and reggae and my older sister listened to electro and hip-hop and I could kind of hear these things included here 
and this whole acid thing as well that I'd kind of heard a little bit of. And it was just a point where they all met, but was at none of them. It was something truly new. And, you know, that's a, that's a point in music, a point in time that is hard to hit. I mean, maybe it's happening now for young people, but because I was young at that time, it meant something to me. Now, you've got a record here, uh, 4 Hero 1, which is all mm. a record that's a good example of, of you know, this, this whole time, this whole era for well, you. Anyway. In, a, in a way, it's, it's past this era. Actually, I, w I wouldn't mind starting before that, actually. I'll start with this um, Ragga Twins, because there was a fusion of hip-hop and, ha you know, there was hip-house in the late 80s, which was kind of relevant to people that liked jacking kind of Chicago, New York house music, and with rapping over the top, you know, like, um, what's his name? Doug Lazy and things like that, you know, Let It Roll and things. But th the kind of the British version was to be a bit more ragger and a bit more uh, jumpy. So... On the same record... And, it, and it's all quite primitive stuff, you know, but... That was a time when there was no name for it. It was just music for music's sake. Now that's on Shut Up and Dance, obviously. You know, how influential was Shut Up and Dance at this point in time? Well, I mean, Reinforced is a label that means a lot to me. And I don't think, if there wasn't Shut Up and Dance, I truly don't think there would be Reinforced, really. <clears throat> I think they, they looked at each other at, at that time, at the early stages, and vibed a lot off each other. Because, you know, Mr. Kirk's Nightmare was the big a full hero thing which was like 89, 90, but Shut Up and Dance were kind of around 87, 88, experimenting with this similar sort of thing. And it's this kind of northwest London sound. And when did you make the transition from, you know, 14, 15 year old eager to just rave it up to actually getting set of turntables and getting active DJing? Well, it was, the, it was the height of the jungle thing, like 92, summer of 92, I was 14, and, and yeah, I, I just got some sound labs and a and a, you know, a basic two-channel mixer and just stayed in and, and learned it and brought, you know, listened to the Jungle tapes and brought Jungle records. Yeah. Um, but then I found Reinforced and, and Reinforced really opened my eyes <clears throat> to a world away from like Ragga Jungle with their, the kind of the, you know, their scientific angle. It was, it was a lot more uh, grown up. And I'd listen to that and think, how the hell do they do that? It's time stretching. Time stretching. Yeah. But in 1992, it wasn't time stretching. It was one of the first records that. It was. They had a pitch ship. They had a, um, a harmonizer. They hired this machine called a harmonizer, uh, which just played it up at, at different pitches. I know with time stretching, you can achieve the same thing, which I later found out. But equipment then was so limited and so basic. I mean, if you can imagine that, everyone you know, here has access to a, a computer with umpteen gig of memory. The samplers that they were using there, the Akai S950, had two and a quarter meg maximum. That was flat out, it was fully loaded, two and a quarter meg. And people will tell you that used to produce before that, yeah, well I used to use a sampler that you had to pedal to use, you know, and things like that. Yeah, well I, had a, I didn't have a sampler, I had to make it all on a guitar, but, you know, everyone has a tale whereby they were more hard done by than the generation before. But it was really, really difficult to make technical sounding advanced music. And they were a real inspiration to me because they were just taking it, you know, it was, they had all these jazz funk, space funk influences that I had no idea what it was. They had all these Detroit influences. I mean, for, for people out there that don't know, um, tell us about Reinforced Records and its importance. Well, as, in yeah, this, as going back thing. to like, Sharp and Dance was very influential. DJ Hype, you know, was with them at the start and it was very early breakbeat, ragga, fusion, electro, acid music. Um, and, and Reinforced was really a very similar thing. Reinforced had some big records that charted, um, like Head in the Clouds and things like that. They did, um, they sold a lot of records, uh, like, you know, 20, 30,000. They had a seven inch single, they were in the charts. I mean, Mr. Kirk sold hundreds of thousands, <clears throat> but they got a bit ripped off with that. Um, but it was the, 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 the template for me, for the attitude and the, the direction for British breakbeat music at that time. I mean, and funnily enough, you know, ironically enough, that was the first label that you went to record, release stuff through. How did, 
How did you go from DJing and at what point did you go right? Well, know? at this stage, you know, this was like late 92, early 93. <clears throat> and I just got an Amiga. Um, uh, whatever the size, Amiga 500 or something. Because at that time it was Atari STs and Amiga 500s. Um, <clears throat> and I had an 8 bit sampler sound card thing that you could plug into the back. And you could, you could make demos on it. You know, I used to get Amens and Apaches and loop them up and tone basses and start learning how to chop breaks on the dirtiest imaginable 8 bit. So actually, it might have even been 2 bit sound. <laughs> Literally, is it? <laughs> I don't know. It's still dirty though. Yeah, it was dirty sound. But there was a guy, Busy B, that used to release records made on Amiga. And um, Mickey Finn and Aphrodite had a big tune uh, made on an Amiga. There's also a guy, Paradox, who still And he still uses still Amiga. Uses Amiga. He's, so it's very basic stuff. Um, but we, we, I, you know, I made some demos, sent them to Reinforced, sent them to three places, to Reinforce, to Vinyl Distribution, which was a big uh, kind of hub label for lots of hardcore drum and bass labels, um, and Libello Blanco, which was another kind of big-ish label. And Reinforced and Libello and, and Vinyl got back to me and said, OK, come in for a chat. And just Reinforced were the most down-to-earth. I mean, vinyl, vinyl were like saying, right, well, we need you to learn how to play the keyboard. <laughs> And, you know, you need to cut your hair and you need to be like this. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm 16. I just want to make records and put them out. Because I, I, I realised quite young that making records was the only way to get on DJing. Um, all I wanted was my own music to swap with people to get into the circle. <clears throat> so, because the drum bass scene, the jungle scene is, to me, as a kid, I just wanted to be in there, I wanted to be doing it. I wanted to be on the scene, on the circuit, I wanted to be a superstar DJ, making rinse out tunes and living the life, like Andy C. Yeah. Um, and I quickly realised that that wasn't going to happen, because, you know, Andy C did Long Dark Tunnel, you know, 31 seconds, which was a massive jungle tune everywhere. And that kind of allowed him into the scene. Mm. Right, Andy, you're in. And that was it. But from then on, I don't remember anyone up to, like, maybe Alex Reese or maybe Ed Russian opt Optical, being allowed into the scene to DJ on the strength of a record. And certainly not just a DJ making it up through the ranks to be a superstar drum and bass DJ. And that's all I wanted, and I realised quite early on that that wasn't going to happen. So I just started making music, and the people at Reinforced, 4Hero, were very um, honest about the music you made. I mean, I've had my dreams shattered by them. With the, with the piece of music that I thought was the best thing I'd ever done in the world. And I'd take it there, sit there, play it to them. Yeah, I don't like it. Right. What do I do now, you know? I'm just going to go and give up. Because they, you know, they were my heroes. They were my inspiration. They were like everything. And they were taking the time to give me criticism and put my records out. But, and all I wanted to do was get on in there and... And was it refreshing to see that Mark and Dago didn't have this whole uh, super drum and bass circuit attitude? Well, well that kind of made me realise that I wasn't going to make it, you know, because Reinforced was this outside thing. Reinforced was Reinforced and then there was the rest of the drum and bass scene. <clears throat> so their, um, their attitude really rubbed off on me to just sort of say, you know what, I can just be one of those people and make those rinse out tunes and go that route, but you're not going to make a mark, really, and you're not, you're not going to get in there because you'll just be doing the same thing. So from that point, I kind of realised you have to go kind of against the grain if you want to be noticed. I mean, tell us about Sonar Circle and, that you know, obviously you took a few more tracks to them and then they were... Yeah, we yes. had like 12 inches, yeah, I had like one 12 inch, then a year passed trying to find what that sound was and it didn't really work, so I found it had another one, okay, a year later another 12, then had a track on um, Enforcers, which was like the big reinforced compilation that they did sporadically. Nice picture discs too. Nice picture discs, yeah, that kind of made them quite famous. Um, but at this stage, I was, trying to, I was trying to make drum and bass with a, a different edge. And it became increasingly hard because the scene was changing. DJs weren't playing what Reinforced was making, and we were just becoming more and more 
obscure. And it wasn't drum and bass anymore. We'd, we'd sort of become something else. But I'll play a track from that period. This is like... This track's called? Us and Them. It's from... Is there any kind of hidden meaning in yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. It's... I mean, the main point says it all. I mean... You say it's got released in 1998, and around this time the whole drum bass scene become very formulaic, there was this, the whole tech step thing, this two step beat, it was boom, yeah. and that's, that's, that was it, that was what was happening, whereas Reinforce was always coming from that breakbeat science point of view of editing drums, which was, you know, that whole jungle. But also fusing live instruments, yeah. you, know, you know, like two pages had happened, <clears throat> and I was obviously very influenced by that, and I wanted to seem like I was being more musical and more thoughtful, um, but with equipment limitations and kind of knowledge limitations, it, I don't feel like I really got it across at that point. I, I mean, I'm happy about how it all went, but that whole album, you know, is like peppered with different tempos and tempo changes. That album's called cool for people out there? Oh, that album was Radius. It was an album I did on Reinforced. Um, but was it's, it's long gone now, you know, you'll never find that. <laughs> Was it disheartening, though, to, to see, you know, an entire scene of what you'd invested so much time and passion and, you know, late night trips to some rave three hours in yeah. Bedford has just kind of gone down this, this really narrow-minded route? Oh, I was, you know, I was shattered. I, I was a fan, a, a, a DJ and a fan of this music, and it was like six or seven years of my life. It just doesn't mean anything anymore. I had a huge collection of drum and bass jungle records that I just looked at and thought, that's it, I've cut it off. That's it, I'm going to cut that point there and it stops and I'll move them away because there's nothing, you know, there's the odd tune now. There's artists like Paradox, Factor and Neptune, Cartridge and Marcus Intellects and people like that that are still kind of pushing it. But pushing it within a kind of frame, you know. There's always this kind of tempo barrier, there's always this kind of structure barrier that makes drum and bass what it is. 64 bars break down. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's really my problem with it. Is if you're influenced by other music, you're not really free to make all of the different music or include all the different musics you like at one point. So I, I couldn't be part of it. I couldn't try and kid myself that I was just going to let it go. I mean, obviously, you know, this, this album takes on a, a wide range of influences and, and you're saying even, you know, you, you, at this point in time you're using, like, live uh, instrumentation, etc. A little bit, yeah. At, at what point, were you, was this still, this whole period was still strictly Sonar Circle or at this point even you started to That was to the point I started to think, you know what, I don't think I can be just Sonar Circle because I'd had seven or eight records out. I was, I can't remember how old I was, six years ago, 20 and I wanted to make more of a go of it. And I met Enrico through Dollis Hill. Enrico had just done the first... When you say Dollis Hill... Dollis Hill is the base of Reinforced... was the base of Reinforced Records. Um, Enrico was going there, that's when he lived in England. And Digo was just about to start 2000 Black and Enrico had just started Archive. And, he, and he'd heard Radius and said, well, I like this mid-tempo weird stuff that you're doing. Why don't you do some for my label? And I did one for, for Digo, for 2000 Black, which is the first Domo thing. Shall I play that? Mm. Um, and then shortly afterwards did one for Archive and kind of found a base in Archive. And Archive, as we learned before, is... Is Enrico's table. <coughs> I look, I look back at that and kind of keep that as the benchmark for what I'm trying to achieve because there's a certain amount of naivety mm. in that because all, all the time, you know, my thing is beats, I program beats a lot of the time and that's what I started doing. But playing keys is another element, writing songs is another element, but the keys thing, you know, the key playing in that is quite naive. Um, but there's something about it that I like, it's rawness and it's kind of untutoredness, which it's kind of really what I'm about. It's, you know, you can, be, you can know too much about music, you can know too many rules. Uh, and that's really what this whole thing is about, it's about rules. You can, you can start to break rules once you understand them, but I think you have a far wider scope if you never actually learn the rules, because there's never a boundary. And once you start saying to yourself, okay, 
uh, it doesn't really sound like house, you know, it's, well, what, then that's what it is, you know, and there should be more of that with, with modern music making. And was it a pretty strange feeling for you at this stage, going from like, you know, you're doing Sono Circle and you're even struggling to get people to play this form of drum bass, to making this record that sounded so fresh and new, and all of a sudden you've got people like Giles Peterson and Patrick Forge going, oh yeah. Well, I, you know, not all of a sudden, I'll hold you up there. Okay. <laughs> it's quite a long, arduous journey. But different, you know, different people started. No, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, a whole other world started to open up to me from that point. That there were people who were open-minded. There were DJs that were had spent their life, well, you know, their adult life fighting for a cause, which was this type of music, which is eclectic music. And I was, hap I, you know, I was lucky to be around at that time when people from lots of different genres were breaking away from whatever their genre was because of the closed-mindedness of it. You know, you have like people like IG Culture who was uh, in a acid jazz hip hop thing, you know, he worked with Young Disciples, he had a thing called Dodge City Productions, which was a big ish hip hop, British hip hop act. He was kind of misguided. You had Phil Asher, who was like a, a, a UK house producer, kind of losing his way a bit. You had Mark and Digo, Four Hero, drum and bass producers, losing their way a bit. And they were kind of elder statesmen, they've all had big deals, they all know how the business works, and they were kind of started to talk about doing something else. And it wasn't just uh, Mark and Digo from Reinforce, you know, there was... Well, we were all there as well, you know, and Seiji when, yeah, when was, was an artist. Seiji, Seiji and G-Force were at, at there as well, and they later went on to work with Orin and Kaidi and Daz to make Bugs. But Bugs was kind of bubbling when we were at Reinforce around that time. Seiji would say to me, oh, you know, you should really do some of this stuff for Bugs. And I'm like, what's Bugs, you know? And even at this stage, there was... Goya, uh, Goya, the distributor that Enrico talked about, has a label called People, People Records, which made, at the start of this scene, very influential records from IG Culture and people like that. Um, and they'd already been out in 1998, and I missed them because I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what my direction was. You know, I kind of like Jazzanova, and I kind of like Fourier, and I kind of like Hefner, and people like this that were being different, but there was no umbrella, there was no name for it. And now, if you want to know what it is, it's called Broken Beat, but I kind of look back at that period, 98, 99, and much prefer it then, because it wasn't called anything, people were just making music and you had to go and find it where it was. And was there a good, like, you know, support network as such, there was, you know, everyone was kind of supportive of each other and... and well, there wasn't was really, it was, it was just people with similar ideas, so it's like people here were working together, yeah, right, okay, we'll do this, and everyone's excited and buzzing because there's no structure, but imagine if we all lived here for three years, we'd kind of do each other's head in after a little while, I don't want to play on the flute today, you know, it's like, just leave me alone, so... <laughs> That kind of happens in a scene. It's the same thing. You don't live together, but you see each other every day. You talk about music every day, and it just wears you down. And in a way, I can see how scenes like you know the UK drum and bass scene, because scenes are there's no one at the centre of a scene saying I'm going to take this scene there and I'm going to control it. It's just a bunch of people making music, and it can go wrong, and and it quite often does. So in a way, you're better off on your own, just thinking about what you're doing and someone you can really trust, rather than entrusting your faith to this, mm. to, you know, to the god of <coughs> Broken Beat. <laughs> Whoever he may be, you know. Come on, god of Broken Beat. Get me there. Get me through. Leave me, leave me through the way. Yeah. I mean, at what point for you did you, you know, uh, there were different influences coming in, be it Detroit Techno mm. or... Well, that all came through Full Hero, really. It was a second hand. And Enrico. Enrico was a really uh, big influence to me on the Detroit side. I, I never really liked any house music, I must say. Sorry if anyone comes from a house music world. But I really hated it. Because I was a breakbeat boy. You know, I liked my breaks. I was a b-boy, I was a d- you know, I came from hip-hop, I came from UK hip-hop. Well, kind of fast US hip hop, like late 80s, early 90s, fast US hip hop, into UK hip hop. And I like breaks. I like funky breaks from, you know, from funk tunes. And, and I, I didn't like disco. I didn't like disco breaks or anything like that. And it's only until the last two or three years I've really let myself kind of, oh, right, you can make nice house music. You can make nice disco influenced music. 
I think it was probably my age, really, because I was just so hardcore. It's like beats. You know, that's it. That's everything. That's life. Um, and scratching. <laughs> and with a being a producer, I just kind of learned to be a bit more open-minded about house music and the subtleties of house music. The same way that hip hop has subtleties that I had to, had to kind of learn. Every kind of established music has a discipline that you must under, kind of understand before you can su subvert it. You know, like before I could kind of subvert the drum and bass that I was making, like make it kind of different. Mm. I had to understand the way that everyone else was doing it. You know what I mean? You have to have some kind of idea of the of the um, of the rule that you're breaking. I mean, how does this work for you? Because obviously, you know, you 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 your music's covering so many different genres. Are you actively, you know, before you start kind of mucking around with this kind of genre, are you actively going out, checking records, you know, checking what's hot or whatever? Well, you know, it's not like I'm some kind of genre prankster that's <laughs> yeah. going around, you know, ha ha, I've, seen, I've found a new genre that must be twisted. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I just like what I like and I interpret that in a way that's trying to be quite honest and pure. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm going to get, I've got into Brazilian music and I'm going to incorporate that into my music. I've got into techno, I, you know, I'm going to incorporate that. And it's just trying to make something different. It's the fusion, it's the fusion element where things haven't been done before. And it's not just like now having mashups, you know, I'm going to take Trick Me Acapella and put it over Depeche Mode, you know. That's not really the same thing. It's, it's more about mixing your influences and creating something that hasn't really been done before. I mean, tell us a bit more about the Rima project. How did that start to take shape? Well, Rima was born out of the communication that me and Enrico had talking about Brazilian music and kind of boogie, slow house music and all that kind of stuff. And, and we thought it'd be quite interesting to make a, an album which fused elements of Brazilian and you know, Latin music and, and that with some tracks that were just kind of blatant boogie house tracks. I mean, I'll play a bit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, on one side we did this cover of uh, Vidigo. And how did this work? Was this, you know, you flying to Verona or...? We like had a couple of sessions together, but um, generally after that we did it by post, which is time consuming. But that was on um, Compost Records. Ja well, Jazz and Over Compost. Just one Rima album? So far, yeah, but that was uh, two years ago, so we really should start doing another one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that was, you know, I was a big fan of Jazz and Over. A th you know, very influential act to me at the time when I wasn't really sure what I was doing. And I was very flattered for them to be interested in having a project with us. And. Um, yeah, that was the outcome of it. We wanted to, you know, kind of quite a high standard of songs and playing, you know, like a lot of live playing, because it's easy for me to slip into studio mode and just jiggle around some sounds and, oh, you know, I can impress the nerds with it. But when you're trying to write songs, when you're trying to make something appear like you're actually a producer, you have to kind of pull out all the stops and make a bit of an, e an effort. And especially now, as the, as the market is how it is, you need, to, if you want to be on top of the game, you, you have to use, you know, you have to have kind of sources that are of, of a high standard to make a product that is... Now, I mean, you, you said earlier on you were kind of given the choice you prefer to work alone. Mm. But as well as the Rain project, you've also, there's the Kudu project. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was a little bit out of my depth with them. I mean, I went to work with Seiji at The Bugs and Mark DeClivelo, who's a native friend of yours, a good you know, keyboard player. Um, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just you know, in an environment where I was a bit out of my depth and a bit out of control. I'd done some beats, and um, they did what they did, and I just kind of sat there and, yeah, that sounds good. And I was quite young and, and shy. How long ago was this? Well, it was like four years ago or something. So, I, you know, it was a bit of a rude awakening. But on the, on the other side of that, just from working with people for one day or two days, like watching someone else program, I learned so much about shortcuts, about 
doing this about you know about mixing and and, and I and I learned a lot and I hated it because it made me feel really small. It made me feel like I didn't know what on earth I was doing because I was in someone else's environment. But it was one of the most positive things that ever happened to me as a producer mm. to realise that maybe my way isn't always the best way. Maybe someone else knows how to do it better. And as a producer, you, you need to realise that you will always learn. And you, you, as you know, you could be the most, re, you know, thoroughly red, nerdy producer in the world, and still someone will come along and show you something that's more about feel than technical. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, but if you do it like this, it gives this certain feel. Oh, right, you know. So, but you, uh, you ended up working with them again on there was a, a dance uh, thing. Yeah, Leg Legends Legend. of the Underground. Legend. Is, uh, Tell us about that. What was it all about? Uh, it's just a project that's that's kind of in the process of <clears throat> hopefully getting fairly big. It's a it's a dance. There's like a dance display, like modern dance, jazz dance, street dance, with a storyline with visuals uh, that kind of work alongside the dancing. And we had to construct some music to it to a, like a kind of storyboard. And I did all the beats. Um, Mark DeClive did all the music with Ben Bisegwe and vocals and. A few other musicians, and then Sagey arranged it all and mixed it. And there was a half an hour presentation. They did it at Paradiso, which is a club in Amsterdam. They had a full house and had a good reaction. But it's it's just an interesting project to try and it's another avenue, isn't it? You know, having your music relate to something that people can go and see, and it's a show. It's the same way as maybe doing some music for television or film. It's another avenue. It's another outlet for people to hear about you. I mean, at this point in time, musically, you know, how many different avenues have you got for what you're doing at the moment? How many different hats are you wearing? There's a lot of aliases out there. But I only really, do, I don't, you know, I only really do it just so that I can keep making music. Mm. Because if I kept doing it as Domu and I made a straight hip hop record as Domu, people would be like, yeah, but that's not Domu. And I can't make drum and bass as Domu now, it has to be so in a circle. So you kind of, I just kind of start building personas, building projects, building possibilities. So I don't like to have all my eggs in one basket. I like to have different projects going in different directions, different labels, different countries, mm. different vibes. And so I just have different names. And I work with different people. So me and Enrico has to be Rima. I do something with my mate Marin that plays bass, and it's for a special, which is a Japanese label, and that's called Bakura. And it's just a name we found on a Star Wars poster is a name of a planet. Oh, okay, we'll be called Bakura. It doesn't mean anything, <laughs> but it was the name for that project. I mean, aside, aside, obviously, you know, if you're going to the studio with a collaborator, it's for a certain project, but when you're in the studio by yourself, I mean, how does this creative process work? Do you walk in there going, right, I'm going to do an Umod thing now, or mm. something just kind of happens along the way and it ends up? Well, I consciously know that I have to do this new Domo album, but and I'm listening to Domu stuff that I'd done before and thinking, right, that's the kind of, that's what I was thinking four years ago, so I should maybe try and incorporate that feeling, what I was thinking about then and where, where that would be now. So yeah, in, in a way, you, I do have different frames of mind for each yeah. project. And I'm aware of when a project needs to be resurrected. Yeah. So you're not going to be doing Just in time, you know, just in, in, in amounts of time. Like Rima, okay, was two years ago. We should start thinking about doing that again soon. But Domu album was three years ago, so I can't avoid the fact that that has to happen. And that's coming out again? On archive. All right. I mean, tell us about Umod, because that, that's a fairly, what, about three, four months ago that was released? Yeah, Umod was again with Jazz and Over on, on Sony Collective. Um, and Umod is Domu backwards. It doesn't take a genius to work that out, but um, <laughs> lots of people didn't. So this is the Umod album, and it was after a touring experience I had. I toured the States for like three weeks, and just kind of felt a bit drained emotionally from all of I, I, I took in a lot of new influences, uh, but also met a lot of people and left them quite quickly, and it's the first kind of long tour I'd been on. How many dates and how many weeks? Well, it was like three, it wasn't so, it was like three weeks, like 17 days, yeah. but it was, it was like nine, Seven, no, about 11 gigs or something, which isn't many, but I hadn't really been away. But the thing was, it was 17 days and I went on 17 planes, because uh, a lot of the journeys were broken between two stops. And I don't fly very well, 
and um, it just kind of upset me, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's all right. But I, I kind of wanted to come home and make a record that uh, had some kind of a bit negative energy in it, you know. <laughs> Um, I spent, you know, a lot of that time listening to a lot of Dabry and Prefuse 73 and things like that. And it's not that I, I didn't want to come home and make a record like that, but I listened to a lot of electronic hip-hop or, you know, IDM, yeah. as, as they call it in, in the States. And um, it was just another different angle. And I remember, you know, a, a big thing for me is making music that actually kind of expresses some kind of emotion. It's all very well making dance music. But dance music can often be quite flat and monotone. I, you know, from the music I've played, I like it to kind of move, to have different sections. You know, if you have a dance record, a house record that has verse, chorus, verse, chorus, it just in terms of the music, not vocals or anything, just has different sections that lead into one another. I think it makes for a lot more interesting listening, because I'm not much of a stoner. You know, but in stoned music, it's very, you know, you get stuck in there and, and it loops you around and it builds very slowly. And I'm all for that at different times, but I don't work stoned, so I don't try and make stoner music. I make music that has peaks and troughs. And for you, how does the creative process work? Do you, is it always with beats? You start off with beats, or...? Generally, well, you, sometimes it can just start with a sound, just like, or a, a, a break from a record. You know, you listen to, oh, right, you hear a nice kind of roads progression thing. You think, oh, I'll loop that up, but then I, then I never just loop it up. I'll replay it. You know, I'll, I'll spread it along the keyboard and I'll replay it. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Um, so it can start with any number of things, really. It can. It rarely starts with an idea in bed. Or, oh wow, I just had a great idea for a song. I'm, I'm sitting at the equipment usually, so. It's not like writing, a, like writing words down. Mm. It's not like I'll be on a train. And th but I, oh, quite often I do have ideas for tunes on a train, and I've got, I haven't got a laptop, so I lose them. I just wish I could get them back, you know. But What's your setup looking like now? You've, you've progressed from the Amiga long, go, long since uh, past. Well, you know, I have a computer. I'm not going to say what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still use an Emu E6400, which was like a late 90s sampler. Um, I had an MPC for a long time, and I didn't program on it. And the, the whole point of having an MPC is to create the swing that an MPC creates, or an SP, or whatever drum machine you have. Uh, and I don't program on drum machines. No idea how you do that. I program on screen. And people say to me, wow, you know, you get such great swings, or, you know, you get, sometimes it sounds like you've got a live drummer, there's so much going on. And you just spend a little time programming drums on the screen. You know, you play it in by hand, program a little bit over the top, and it can sound quite intricate quite quickly. I mean, it would seem that, you know, you're fairly productive. You, you manage to get things out and happening. Is this true or false? Well, I work every day, you know, and I get up and I work. And that's it. I get, you know, I wake up in the morning and start making music. You don't linger in there, you just get it done. Yep. I sometimes go into the studio, you know, straight in my pants, just wake up, straight in there, don't wash till, you know, there's a massive beard and so, whoa, I've been in there three weeks, you know, and all that kind of thing. I'm sure lots of producers are like that because my studio is just in my house and it's just another room in my house. Um, but I don't really work on the basis where if I have an idea at like eight at night, I don't just go and work because I have to live, I live in the world with my girlfriend and I live in kind of normal time, you know. And I don't just go and work, I work work hours. So it kind of creates a regime for myself where I, I know I'm most creative in the morning. I'm most creative up and at like 12 midday, I'm working, you know, my mind's ticking over. I've done all the boring programming stuff in the morning, then it's just creativity from like 12 to 3, mm. and then like 3 o'clock start to dip because I'm getting hungry or something. So. Now you, I mean, you've been touring a lot more so in the last couple of years. I mean, how's touring, you know, affected uh, or given you new inspiration musically? Well, Umod is a good example yeah. of that. 
Um, but like Japan, you'd be going out to Japan a bit as well. The thing with DJ, like being influenced by DJing is kind of not really that constructive because you can come home from DJing and see what works on the floor because I don't often play much of my music out on the dance floor, very rarely, because uh, I don't like seeing people stop dancing to it. Um, but, you know, when, when, when you start to see what works on the dance floor, it can change the way you make music. So someone like, you know, from the drum and bass scene, say Dillinger. Mm. Dillinger, up to around 94, 95, used to make quite experimental drum and bass. Then I think there was a point where he started DJing and started to realise what worked on the dance floor. And it just changes your whole attitude because you're then starting to make music for the dance floor. And then you lose this whole element of the mind. You know, it should be three things, mind, body and soul, music. Should be, and, and it should appeal to all of those at once. And there's music that's just for dancing, there's music that's just for crying to, there's music that just to kind of make you think and is political. But if you can try and incorporate all three of those into a record, then I think it, 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 it makes it last forever. It makes it work on so many different levels. I mean, <clears throat> depending on where you play, there's certain people that, you know, pe different people have heard your music via different uh, names, etc., and people are booking you to DJ. Are they, are they all after, they, they want to book you as Domo, or they want to book you as this or that? If, as long as I know what their night is, I can, if it's an eclectic, I mean, I would rather play, I hate, you know, it's a horrible word, isn't it, eclectic? I am an eclectic DJ, but it's... I wanted to just be able to play what I'm, the records I'm feeling at that time and old records that I like, that are relevant to that kind of... that movement. Um, if it's a strictly house club, I would kind of struggle playing house all night because I'll get a bit bored. Likewise with drum and bass. I like to be able to kind of move around a bit, you know, play play a bit of hip-hop halfway through to kind of chill everyone out a bit and take it back up again to like, you know, one... And there's lots of different music I get, a lot, lot, lot of different BPMs. 100, 100, 105, 110, 150, 180, you know, 120, up to like 130 BPM, like fast, two-steppy, you know, broken beat kind of stuff. And it's all relevant at a different point in the night. And not just start slow and go faster and faster, because by five in the morning you'd be playing Gabba, you know. <laughs> it doesn't quite, you know, you don't want to do that. But just understanding what the crowd needs at different points. And I have a lot of respect for people that just play records as well. They don't bother about mixing, they don't care what tempo it is. Here's a good record. Yeah. Play it from start to end, here's another good record. And there's no, that skill is perhaps better than being technically good because you're playing records that are just absolutely amazing. And I'd rather kind of hear that than seamless mixing all night. I mean, you, you come from a background, I do believe, in turntablism. Like, you've kind of mastered a little bit. I'm nowhere near mastered. I, I used to watch it, I used to watch the videos, and I used to go to DMC things in the UK. Um, and I quite quickly realised that I didn't have the time to commit. I was always interested in scratching from, from hip-hop days. I couldn't really scratch on my first decks because they were belt drive and they, ooh, you know, it just didn't work. But as soon as I got my Technics, I was like practicing scratching and tried to break my other hand in so I could deck to deck and stuff and I was really into it. But I just realised it takes literally eight or nine hours of practice a day and I'd have to give up eating, <laughs> you know, girlfriend. I, I just, just wasn't time. <laughs> I mean, another thing that's kind of missing from, from the whole picture is the label. Mm. I mean, it seems that everyone that starts producing after a while, they get their own label, yes. Um, why? Just can't be bothered? Kind of. <laughs> uh, I just haven't got time. I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm the most business-minded. I have a very basic business attitude, which is, if I can sense that you're not going to rip me off, I'll be nice to you. <laughs> and until the point you rip me off, I won't work with you again. And that's it, you know. And I'll treat people the way I expect them to treat me. And that's it. That's all my business attitude is. And no I don't, bad experiences so far? No. I've, it's oh. been great, you know. But that's because I fell in with Reinforced. And Reinforced are very down to earth. You know, Full Hero have been messed about in the past with, with record things that went wrong. And so they had a great deal of experience in that. And they kind of know what it's like to be young and eager. 
and I, I was very lucky to fall in with them. But yeah, of course, it's very easy to be suckered, uh, especially with complicated things like publishing and licensing and money that's owed to you. And I don't know if I really appeal to to a major label. If but you, you kind of being, you know, I'm kind of fairly unclassifiable as an artist because of all of the different names and all of the different styles. So I'm not sure. If anyone wants to sign me, I think it's fine. I mean, future-wise, you said you, you're working on the new Domino album for, um, for Archive. What else is happening at the moment? Uh, is, Nicola, is Nicola Kramer? Yeah, I've got like three. I've got the Bakura album burning at the back. The Domino album nearly finished. This Nicola Kramer project that she sang on the Rima album and the Domino album. Actually, I'll play a track on the Domino album. Because I'm kind of quite proud of this because I, I kind of wrote the, you know, the words to this and it's a bit of a sad falling out of love song. Um, but I've done a whole album with her and it's just taking a long time to, to finish just because vocalists are hard to pin down sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> how, uh, how long are you working with her for? I used to be in a band with her. It's been like a jazz funk band. I was just, I was the DJ. I just did the cuts in the band, and we, you know, we did all right. We collective unconscious. Collective unconscious. We were called, and we, you know, we did jazz cafe and stuff like that, and just kind of reached this thing where you're 18 or 19 years old. You're in a band. <laughs> where do we? Do, what do we do now? I didn't have the the production skills or knowledge to record them as a band at that time. So it just kind of disbanded, but I still work with them on different projects, and I work with her. Um, but it's a shame, because as a band, they would be perfect for me to take Domu live, because I've known them for 10, so 12, up to now, you years. So you haven't done the Domu thing live? Well, no, because it's so, like, studio fiddly, it doesn't really translate into live very well, because it's all about sample manipulation. I mean, with laptops and stuff, you could probably do it now, but... Uh, it wouldn't be because it's not completely live. Uh, this 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 whole semi-live thing. I really don't know where I stand with it. With the uh, Rima project, <sighs> the logistics are just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unbearable to think about. And uh, yeah. but again, with a band, you know, you need to pay people for rehearsals. You need to have a a, a group of dedicated musicians that are going to turn up for every practice, practice for a week, go on tour for a week or a month, whatever, and they need to be around mm. and there's not many people the situation just isn't perfect to have that I wish there were enough musicians around that I knew in my position that were working and at a standard that could play my music and didn't demand to be paid to come to practice you know because they it's just hard to make it happen it's hard to make a start um, at this point I might stop asking questions and uh, let you take over what we got here and what's what's happening man well, <laughs> I don't really know what I'm going to do with it. I just wanted to kind of demonstrate the difference between using single hits and sounds, which is like house music or hip-hop programming, to using breaks. And I'm not going to make a tune or anything. I just wanted to kind of give a visual kind of difference mm. of, of what I think are the two kind of major different ways to start making a beat. A break beat or single hits. So I was just going to do a bit of fiddling. I'll, I'll let you get in and have a fiddle then. Okay. <laughs> right, are we on? Okay. I haven't loaded up a break, but I've just got um, some single hits here. So with the drums, that, you know, that you find, um, certain drums sound right for certain things. And there's certain places to find certain drums, because uh, funk drums are generally quite loose and quite gritty and dirty, and, and they're not really good for, for being the main sound up front, you know, like a hip-hop tune or something like that. Um, so I, it's a bit cheeky, but I tend to sample from records that I like, from whatever genre, where it's a producer that I kind of trust. 
and there's not really anything, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I used to have this big thing in drum and bass times about not sampling from drum and bass tunes to make drum and bass. And I think that's kind of, I think if you're going to make a hip hop tune, I'd sample from a house tune or something or a funk tune. I'd rarely sample from its own genre. That's just a funny thing that I have. I also have this thing where I never play the same record off of one 12 inch in a night. Because I think that's kind of cheating. Even if it's a really strong B side? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know, it's just a funny thing I have. Anyway, these. Um, I mean, the way that I work basically is just I play it in by hand. Anyone want to tell me where this kit's from? Because it's all off the same record. Any super nerds? Huh? So you know, I'll just play, that would be like a housey, slow housey Theo Parrish thing where you could... Or classic hip hop beat. Or you could do a... You know, if you're, <laughs> if you're into Des Destiny's Child from 98. <laughs> but that, but you know, that's, 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 that's the kind of thing, you, that can start a tune, just whatever, whatever swing you decide to apply to it, whatever rhythms you've got in your head, or even, you know, drum and bass. You know, I mean, there's like, you could do whatever you want with, a, with any kind of kit, and then elaborate on it and add to it. So, I don't really know what my point is. My point is that, with any set of sounds, I think you could just kind of jam it out and make whatever rhythms you have in your head at that time. And I think that really is the way to, for, that I start my music. It's like, well, I've been you know, listening to a lot of this, I've been listening to a lot of that, and just the first rhythm that comes into my head, I'll, I'll put it down and then that'll be it, that'll be the, the thing. And, and hip hop and house and drum and bass can all be made this way. Or broken beat, and, and often you know you're trying to think, trying to make a. But if you sped that up to any, you know. So. But the thing is, it works because these sounds sound quite nice, and I could do it with a set of sounds that sound rubbish, and it wouldn't be inspiring. So you know the point is, I think it's all about the integrity of the sounds that you choose. Um, and that's kind of my point about this really, is that if you, can, if you can source out a nice set of sounds that will inspire you, if you've got rhythms in you, then it will happen, then the tune will happen. But if you've just got a load of <coughs> duff sounds that are presets from a, a module or something, I, I'm not sure if it will... It wouldn't inspire me anyway. It might, yeah. it, it might be just the way that some people work. But I work with samples, and all of these samples are... Sorry, is this not, is this not happening? No, no, no. Is there anyone else who's got any questions at this point? Yeah. Switch on, I don't know. Um, check, check. Someone up there? Check again. So yeah, it's uh, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, could you dive a little bit into this, um, how you find the good sounds, or if you got some, let's say you got some uh, funk sample, what exactly you do with the sample you got to cut it up into the pieces and then reuse it? Because it, you say like, uh, yeah, it's important to use uh, good samples or good sound, but how do you find them? Or how do you process them? Um. There's a couple of ways, really. I, I don't, I'll only refer to the visual aid if I need it, but I can kind of pretty much explain it with it, you know, I'll, I'll, if I need to. Um, with a sound, with a waveform, if you see the waveform, 
it will sound slightly different with how much space you have at the start of it and how much space you have at the end of it. So a sound like a hat, a hi-hat will sound completely different with loads of noise at the end of it or how tightly and it's chopped. Um, and likewise with the space at the start of the sample, when you press the key, because that's late, that's blatantly late, but when I play that, that will give it natural swing. If it was bang on the dot, it would be tight. And when I play that break and when it's quantized, that will be just super tight. And that will be a sound. But then there's also another type of sound where all, the, all of the hits aren't super tight. And that creates another sound. It creates a looser kind of sound, which is more organic. So it depends where you're coming from musically. You have to learn, right, all, I want all my sounds to be tight on this thing, or it's going to be loose. Like, you know, kind of solely loose hip-hop, like, this kit would be good. Because... Let's find a snare. Because all the sounds are a bit late. And if you programmed it and didn't quantize it, it would sound fairly loose. But if I went into all of those sounds and got all the start points, it would sound a bit less vibey. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Anyone else with any more? Um, so you're sleeping in the middle of the night and the broken beat god climbs mm. through your window and he kidnaps you and he leaves you on this island and you have, he says you can use three instruments, hardware or software since what, you know, what are you using right now? What are your three, you know, kind of things that you just, you'd have to have in your computer? You already got your operating system and your uh, logic. So you've got a computer. You've got the computer, you've got logic, but you, you can choose three things. You can take hardware or uh, VST. What about a, mi a microphone? Yeah, you can get all your recording equipment. That's already there. <laughs> Records? That's taken care of too. <laughs> um, right, my emu. Not, my, not the animal. It'd be, ridi <laughs> be ridiculous. Unless I got hungry, but I don't eat meat, <laughs> don't eat meat anyway. But I could ride around the island on it, but... Um, the emu sampler, definitely. Uh, it's, and that's all you... I, I, um, a keyboard, I definitely need some kind of outboard. Because I, you, it's nice to have tweakability of the keyboard. It's all very well having, a, you know, a plethora of uh, plug-in synths. Um, and you do have this hands-on thing with, with the plug-ins. You can, you know, you can interface with them very well. But there is a certain sound that comes from analog keyboards that you can't recreate. So I would have something fairly versatile, like a Juno, fairly versatile keyboard that you can bass, pads, lead with a bit of tweakage. Nice old warm thing, you know, 60 or even a 106 would be all right. Um, sampler keyboard. OK, that's cool. Yeah. Mar maracas. <laughs> no, a shaker. I always, I always have a shaker with me. Because a little egg shaker doesn't take up any space, but a little bit of live shaking on a record can give it so much vibe. It, it can, you know, you have a programmed beat. If you, just turn, if you just turn on the mic, don't even need a pop shield or anything, or even a decent mic. Just shake her into it, in, straight into audio for a few bars, EQ it up, compress it, whatever. Sounds lovely, and it sounds live. <laughs> And if you do all your extra programming on top, you have feel, because it's come from you. Yeah, we've been using, actually Dave has a shaker that his, a friend of his made on the fly from a restaurant, and she found like a, I don't know if it was a floss container, and put some sugar in it, and we've been using sugar, it Sugar, beans, Every single rice. track here, there's been a shaker on it. Anything, so you can, anything is a, exactly, hey, let's all make body sounds and record them, but no, but like, Anything is a possible source of sound. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say, I'm not Herbert, you know, I can't... I don't do, the, you know, that's great, and that's his thing. But it is, it's true, it's possible. You need to be resourceful. And that kind of can lead into the point of you don't need much equipment. You really don't. It's more about the, the ideas you have and the, 
the few sounds you use, the choice of sounds. I think that's really my point with this, is that if you choose the right four or five sounds, you can have a great record. Mix it well, sounds great, and that, that's it. It's more, about the, it's more about the process of putting something good in rather than putting something average in, working on it for 10 years and getting something good out, you know? Anyone else here? Now you're going to be around uh, the whole rest of the evening uh, in the production studio, I do believe. Yeah. Thank you bits and pieces. So if anyone else throughout the course of the day feels like asking you anything, they're more than welcome. Tell you a good joke as well. Yeah. Dominic, thank you very much.